Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along. Yes, so um, I'm speaking about BDD, Behavior Driven Development, um, specifically using the new Cucumber JVM along with Groovy. So let's get right into it. Just a bit about myself. My name's Marco. Um, I'm a JVM language developer these days, I guess. Um, I think nobody can bind themselves to one thing. Um, I'm working in London at the moment. I live and work around London and I currently work for um, a consultancy called Equal Experts. And in my free time, I work on GVM. So that's my pet project. Um, and then you can find me blogging at Wired for Code and I'm on Twitter, of course. Good, so a little bit about this talk. Um, firstly, we're gonna start off and just talk about what BDD is. I think we've all heard of BDD before, but lots of people seem to be very uncertain about what it is. So I'll just summarize very briefly what it actually entails. Um, we're gonna be looking at the good and the evil of BDD as well, because a lot has been said about BDD in the industry, and there's been a lot of mixed press about it. So we're just gonna speak about those things and kind of expose some, some fallacies and speak about some good points as well. Um, then we're gonna go on and we're gonna look at Cucumber as a basic solution for doing or um, for running BDD in a project. We're gonna do a little um, test-driven development using BDD demo, just a quick one just to show you the basic life cycle of how it's done. And then we're gonna look at the Grails Cucumber plugin. Um, with a little sample application. So there's a lot to cover, so um, some of the parts I might move a little bit faster. So just a quick word about the demo, just to avoid confusion. The demo is themed around my favorite cartoon of all time. It's called Invader Zim. Um, it's an American cartoon that aired on um, Cartoon Network around about 2001, after which it was abruptly discontinued due to the 9-11 disaster. Um, and as a result, it's it just attained an absolute cult following all over the world. So um, I've just written a very light little application that uses that as a theme, so just that you know what it's about. Um, so the two main characters in Invader Zim are Invader Zim himself and his little helper robot, Gur. So uh, you'll be meeting them later. Good, so let's start off with just a basic definition of what BDD is. So this is a tweet by a guy called Dan North. Um, Dan North is considered the father of behavior-driven development. He conceived the whole idea. And um, last year, he tweeted this, and for me, it just stuck out so much. It was like the perfect definition, and I'd never really heard a real good definition of what it was. So he says, BDD in a tweet is using examples at multiple levels to create a shared understanding and surface uncertainty to deliver software that matters. So let's go through that line by line and just, just get a bit of an in-depth look at what each of those lines mean. So the first thing he says is using examples. So I think one thing that's, that's very typical about BDD is that you use real-world examples when you write your code, when you te write tests for your code. Um, so you, you actually start with real tangible examples. You're not as much focused on the implementation of what you're going to write as, as what, what's actually expected of it from the outside. You can do this at multiple levels as well. So you won't typically do that in your acceptance tests alone, as some people think, but you can actually apply this when you write your integration and unit tests as well. So why do we do behavior-driven development? So the, the main reason that you do it is so that you have a shared understanding, not just with other developers, but also with people like your product owners, people like your QA team, um, UX experts, um, business analysts, all those people need to have a shared understanding so the reason why we want to have a shared understanding with all these people is so that we can surface uncertainty. We can, we can if anything is unclear for the developer um, or for anybody else in the room, we can first speak about it before we start writing a single line of code, which means you avoid that annoying thing, they call it the boomerang effect, where you write something, you implement something, thinking that it's exactly what you should be doing, 
and then you deliver it, and then it's actually completely different to what they actually wanted. And so you go back and forth and waste so much time. So why not have those conversations up front and then start developing? So that's one of the biggest things that BDD aims to, to solve. So at the end of the day, it helps you deliver software that matters. I think that's the bottom line. So it's a, it's a pretty positive thing to bring into your projects. Now, how would you do this in practice? It's nice talking about all these theoretical concepts, but how would you actually go about doing this? So, um, firstly, you would call a meeting with all the stakeholders, all the people involved. So like I said, your QAs, your devs, um, product owners, all those people that are, that are involved in that development life cycle. You'll pull, pull them into a room and you'll start writing a high-level specification written in plain English. Um, this specification, when we use Cucumber, will be in a very, very, very light markdown called Gherkin. That's the language that Cucumber exposes for you to write your specification in. Now, it's so lightweight that you'll barely notice that it's a language at all. It's actually plain text with the occasional keyword and a bit of an indentation scheme. That's about all there is to it. Once you've finished that meeting and you've, you've had your discussions and you've kind of eradicated any, any strange ideas and everybody's on the same page, you take that specification and you turn it into an executable specification. So you do that by running it through a tool like Cucumber. So you'll run these tests and these tests will automatically go into a pending unimplemented state. Um, in Cucumber, it's usually an orange state. So when TDD you have red, green, refactor, you now have an orange state up front, orange pending. Then you'll go and you'll write some failing tests. So that's your red state. Then you'll go and write the actual implementation and your tests will go green. So that's the typical cycle that you'll go through when you're develop, developing with BDD. And you'll normally do that on a on a feature basis, on a per feature basis, maybe a small story or something, um, you'll actually go and you'll write these specifications and pull them all the way through that life cycle. Good, but behavior driven development has had some bad press. So I think one of the main reasons is I see BDD as a slightly, and it's almost like an orphan child. Um, so the people who initially created BDD, conceived it, um, started out really excited, but being the innovators they are, they moved on to other things. So they, they moved on to, to more exciting other methodologies, and they're still doing that. Um, and they kind of left the whole BDD community in a lurch and handed it over to a group of people who I think maybe created too much marketing hype and started selling consultancy and all sorts of things around this. They saw this as like a new, the next hot thing, you know, and started selling it, overselling it. Another thing that's maybe damaged um, BDD a little bit is people that have started doing acceptance test-driven development, but to the exclusion of all other kinds of testing. So that's extremely dangerous. They just write acceptance tests and then they totally forget about unit tests and integration tests. I've even worked in an organization where it was so extreme that they had a separate team writing acceptance tests and another team writing the implementation. And shockingly, the other team didn't even write unit tests or any kind of tests. They totally depended on what the other team was doing. So that just smells, right? You don't want that happening in your organization. So I think it has, in a sense, left a bit of a bad taste in the mouth. Um, so this is a tweet by um, Azla Kalsoy. He's the creator of Cucumber. And he, he wrote something really interesting on Twitter. Um, there's a blog associated. I'll quickly go there. So Azla um, basically wrote this blog on the 3rd of March this year. Um, stating that he felt that Cucumber was the world's most misunderstood collaboration tool. 
And it's quite a sad uh, blog. He, he says, Cucumber reached a million downloads in the first three years and five million downloads three years later. And I'm happy to have created such a popular tool, but saddened to see how it's misused and misunderstood. If you think Cucumber is a testing tool, please read on, because you are wrong. And then he just goes on and he explains how the crux of Cucumber and BDD is actually all about collaboration. It's about communicating with people. That's all it's really about. And Cucumber is merely a tool to help us, to facilitate us into getting into that flow. But if you think that Cucumber is just another testing tool, that's definitely not what it's about. Right, on the other hand, that's enough negative. Let's look at the positives. I believe nothing is new under the sun, and same holds true for BDD. Um, BDD is just the next phase in the evolution of test-driven development. Test-driven development took us so far, and it was fantastic, and we still all use it, I hope, but BDD takes us that next little step and adds the human part into that equation. It just, it just makes it more personable and more usable and more open for the whole team to be involved, not just the little developer sitting with their headphones on writing code all by themselves. So, like I said already, it inspires collaboration. I think that's a huge plus. It also helps us shift our focus away from what we're implementing. Um, and focuses us more on the behavior of the code we're writing. So when Dan North started with Cucumber, he initially, he took JUnit and forked it. And has everybody used JUnit? Just put up your hands if, yeah, most of the people, good. So with old JUnit 3, um, there was this convention that all your tests needed to have a suffix of the word test or test at the end. Um, that was like the convention. So what he did is he, in his fork, he changed that to be behavior. So if he was writing a test for a book controller, he would write it as book controller behavior. Then you also remember that the prefix of each method was test. So he changed that to be should. So now you've got this behavior describing what you're testing, and then each method would be um, should return a list of books, for instance. So that immediately changed the focus and made you think in terms of what it was that you implement, or what, how it should behave when, when you're implementing this, not thinking about the actual nuts and bolts of how you were going to do this. That's almost second to the problem. The, the thing you should actually be focusing on is that behavior up front. So, and obviously that, that evolved and moved on, and that's, but that's how BDD was originally born. Um, another thing that's great, it gives you a body of living documentation. And that's a really powerful thing. It's something that will grow and evolve with your application. And it'll always be a go-to place that you can go to and see exactly what your application is meant to be doing. Abundance of tools available. We'll look at those in a second. And it's simple and lots of fun to do. Good, so I'll just breeze through this. Um, the tools currently out there, I'm sure there are more. I don't think this is exhaustive. Um, JBehave, so that's the initial one that Dan North started working on um, to popularize BDD. Very similar to Cucumber. Um, Concordian, Fitness, this is uh, written by Uncle Bob and his son, I believe. It's a wiki-based BDD tool. EasyB is an interesting one. This one's got a groovy DSL by default, but for some other reason, um, the Groovy community hasn't really adopted it. I've seen it used more in Java shops than in Groovy shops. Spock, um, so I, I don't really think Spock is a pure BDD framework, but Spock allows us to apply BDD at unit test level and integration test level. So I normally use Spock hand in hand with Cucumber. I'll use Cucumber for my acceptance tests, and then I'll use Spock to write my integration and unit tests. Jasmine for JavaScript, and of course, Cucumber is the one we'll be looking at today. 
So let's take a very quick look at how we can just bring Cucumber into a very simple project, um, any Gradle project, in fact. So there's a few things that we need to do. We need to add some dependencies to our build file. Uh, we need to introduce a JUnit test runner because Cucumber is built on top of JUnit. Um, we need to add some Gherkin. So Gherkin is that, that very light markdown or markup, whatever you want to call it, your specification. Step definitions are little snippets of Groovy that sit behind these executable specs that actually do the work and call into your application. And then lastly, we've got hooks and tags. We'll look at those later. So typically, inside your build.gradle, um, that's all you need to do. Um, apart from having Groovy, you would need JUnit 4.11. Um, then you just need a Cucumber Groovy bridge and a Cucumber JUnit bridge, and it'll pull in all the transitive dependencies and just start working. Right, so I mentioned that you need to have a test runner. So this is literally an empty class um, that's going to sit in your test folder. It's, um, it's annotated with run with Cucumber, so Cucumber is the test runner. And then you've got a bunch of Cucumber options. That's just an annotation you add to that class um, that will just configure Cucumber at runtime. That also tells you things like, for instance, um, where your features lie. Uh, it'll also have the places where it'll find step definitions, it'll define tags, and things like HTML output. Right, so that is what Gherkin looks like. That's what a specification looks like in Cucumber. As you can see, it's very, very simple, and anybody can understand it. You don't have to be a programmer to read that. So at the top, you'll always have a feature keyword and just a few words describing what exactly your feature is. So in this case, we're going to write something that's going to calculate. So that's our feature. Then you'll describe multiple scenarios for developing that feature. In this case, our first scenario would be to add two numbers. Um, then you'll see underneath there, you have another three keywords, given, when, then. So that's very typical in BDD. You always describe a precondition, an action, and a postcondition. So given the input 2 plus 2, when the calculator is run, then the output should be 4. So that's our first scenario. Our second scenario is very similar, except now we're doing a subtraction. So under the hood, when Cucumber starts up, oh, by the way, that's in a dot .feature file, typically, and that will live by convention under source test Cucumber. The file backing that, the actual Groovy script, so this, this is just a plain Groovy script, um, it basically has definitions for all those steps that we've just described. Now, when you look at this, you might get a bit of a shock because it's all regex, right? Now, you don't have to worry about writing these because the, cu the Cucumber command line and IntelliJ actually generate all of this for you. You don't have to do anything. You literally click and it'll create that, and then all you need to do is write those little snippets of groovy code inside there. So. That's all there is to it. Um, also, something that's really nice is that it actually reuses these, we call these step definitions. It, uses, it reuses these step definitions. So in that feature file over there, you would only have to define three step definitions, and it actually, it'll just reuse them. It'll take those little snippets in quotes and pass them through as parameters to those closures defined there. So how Cucumber works is it just builds up a big map of all these step definitions. The key values, or the keys are all just those regex expressions, and then the values are actually closures that it'll invoke in the right sequence, passing in the parameters. A very simple tool, but highly effective. Good. So. Hooks are basically like your before class and after class in a JUnit test. Um, typically, they get fired before and after each scenario. And you can also focus them to be specific to a feature or specific to a just single scenario. 
Right, so I'm going to do a tiny little demo just showing you the flow of how you would go about writing that very example that we just looked at. So, there we go. Right, so there we go. That's the scenario um, or the, uh, the feature file. So you'll see our project structure. We've got all those artifacts that we just spoke about. There's our, our empty test runner. Um, we've got an empty step definitions file already lying there waiting. So all we're going to do now is we're going to implement this bit of functionality. And you'll see how easy it is and how similar it is to normal test-driven development. So you'll see this lovely um, skin color. That means it's unimplemented. It's not the best color they've chosen. but So all you do is you hit Alt-Enter and create a new step definition. And you can tell IntelliJ where you want these step definitions to land. So let's put it in our empty step def file. So there we go. Good. So it's generated that regex for us. Um, just and we just want to rename that variable to something more meaningful, input. Okay. So when we go back, we'll now see that that skin color is gone and it's now a normal color. So let's do that for all the steps before we run it, just to save some time. So we're going to just create all of those. Good. So now we've got all the steps. And you see there was, oh, sorry. I'm going to have to step out. Sorry, there's a, a bug in IntelliJ at the moment. <laughs> when, you, uh, when you hit Alt Tab on IntelliJ while it's in presentation mode, then you lose the window and you can't get it back in any way. It's very annoying. <laughs> okay, and we're back. Right, so there we have it. Um, our step definitions and all our features are now a normal color, as you can see. Okay, so let's let's fire this up and see what it does. Right, so there we see the orange state that I was speaking about. All these tests are orange at the moment. So let's focus on the first one. Let's get the first one passing, and then we'll move on to the second. So if we run that first by itself. Right, so just like in TDD, let's take the first step, the input 2 plus 2, if we step in there. Let's write the code that we wish we had. So we're writing a calculator, so let's instantiate a new calculator, even though we don't have such a class. Um, and we'll pass that input in via the constructor. Good, so to make that compile, let's create that class. Good. And let's just give it an input field of type string. Excellent. That now compiles. And if we run that, we should now see our first step go green. There we go. Right. So the next step is when the calculator is run. So. This is a Groovy script, so it's got a binding just like any other Groovy script. So we can literally say calculator equals new calculator, and then use the calculator in the next step, because that script will still be alive for the duration of that entire scenario. So now we can say calculator.run. Obviously, that's not going to work, because we don't have a run method yet. So let's just, once again, to save time, we won't run the test. But let's just add a void run method, like so. Nothing in it. And there we go, two steps passing. 
Next one, the output should be 4. So, as we always do in TDD, we just do the simplest thing possible to make the test pass. So, let's assign the output of that run method to a result and put it in the binding. And let's assert that the result is the same as the output coming from our cucumber spec. If we run that, that's going to fail because we've got a void return on that calculator run method. So there you'll see it null returned. Good, so let's make the return type a string and we're simply going to return 4. And running that there you have it, our first scenario passes. And that's obviously not good enough. We probably, we're definitely going to see that our second test is going to fail because that's not going to be four, right? So there we have it. So all that remains is this last step that we need to implement. So let's go in and let's fix, fix this problem properly. So we'll introduce a new field here. Um, we're just going to add a a new Groovy shell to do the work for us, the benefits of Groovy, and what we'll do is we're going to simply evaluate what's in the input. There we go, and that will implicitly return it to the, um, to the step definition. When we run that now, everything should be green. And there we go. So you see, it's a, it's a very similar approach to what you do in normal TDD. It's just got that initial bit up front, and it's got this lovely benefit that anybody using your software will immediately understand and know what's going on. Very straightforward. Any questions about that? Everyone clear? Yeah? Good. Good, so next let's take a look at the Grails Cucumber plugin. So obviously you can do all of the stuff that we just did now in a Grails app as well. And I think that's where most people will actually end up using it um, in the Groovy community in, inside the Grails apps. Because Grails apps are, are UI apps and this is obviously very well suited for acceptance testing. So um, it's developed by a guy called Martin Hauner You'll see him around quite often. He's a great guy. He's very active in that space, and he's, uh, he's the, the main person behind this plugin, and he's doing a great job. Um, so there's the plugin portal. I just wanted to show you his GitHub wiki page because this is really, um, he's got a whole bunch of guides on how to actually get this working inside your application. So. You see there, there's a whole bunch of really, really well-written documentation. And I recommend, if you, if you want to get into Cucumber, specifically with Grails, go and work through these, because it's very well-written. You'll do them each in maybe half an hour, and you'll be able to master this in no time. Good. So, what are the features of this plugin? So, firstly, um, he's introduced convention over configuration here. So um, we don't have to explicitly do all the things that we had to do in the previous example, like um, add a test runner and all sorts of things like that. Plumbing that you would have to do manually in a normal Gradle build, you can just get for free with the Grails plugin. Easy configuration, so a very simple um, builder config file that just builds up your config for you. Um, like I said, no test runner. It runs inside the functional test phase of Grails and works great with Jeb. So I always use it with Jeb when I'm testing a UI application. Um, if I'm testing RESTful endpoints, I'll just use um, Groovy WS Lite. Um, great command line integration. IDE support is inherent with Cucumber, so in IDE, in IntelliJ IDE especially. Um, 
I'm not sure about Eclipse, but um, yeah, I, I think it is well supported there as well. And like I said, it's under very active development. So let's take a look at what it takes to get it working in your Grails app. So, like I said, an Invader Zim theme in this app that we're going to be writing. Um, I'll basically f I'll explain all the parts of the application and then afterwards we'll run it up and you'll actually see it running, these acceptance tests. Um, so we're going to write a quote resource page that's going to allow you to display quotes of Invader Zim and Invader Go. So it's a walking skeleton through the app, r calling right through from the front end, right through into the database, and it's lit literally just one little functional sliver um, from top to bottom. So, right, so the first part you need inside um, your build config of your Grails app is you need to add Cucumber 0.10.0 um, inside the plugin section. There's the builder for configuration, so that lives in its own config file now. This was what we originally saw inside this. So you can see it's much neater than having to annotate this. Um, so that now just literally lives in its own file and is much easier to read. Right, your Gherkin feature. So in this case, our Gherkin will read invader quotes, our scenario is um, invader Gur quotes by name, given an invader named Gur, and the invader Gur says, can I be a mongoose dog? When, I, when a quote is requested for Gur, then we are taken to the quote page and we can see, um, can I be a mongoose dog? So that will live in a Grails project under test cucumber, usually. Um, but as you saw in the Cucumber config, you can make that any location you want within your project. Step definitions generated for you once again, but here we have something additional to what we had in the previous example. So firstly, it lives under test Cucumber steps under its own little folder. We've got GORM, so in these scripts you can instantiate new entities and persist them. So you can literally, here we have a quote class, um, you can instantiate the quote class with a name coming from your specification, and um, you can just call the .save method on it. We've got Jev as well. So you'll see in the second step definition, we navigate to a quote page, and then in the third step, we actually call a method on the page which does some assertions. There's our domain class, very simple. Um, a quote with a string name and a message. Jeb configuration. Um, this is literally just going to set Jeb up um, with Chrome driver, but you can do it with Selenium as well, with, um, with Firefox driver for Selenium. Jeb, has everyone used Jeb? Can I just see a show of hands? Yeah. So um, I think Colin Harrington's doing a talk on Jeb tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Well worth seeing. Um, it's a really great tool. So there's our page object for the quote page. So this represents everything that's on that quote page that's going to be rendered. So we've got the URL of the page and um, the the um, closure that describes the at, which is the assertion on the title, and then there's the method that we call through, quote.text. Very simple. Environment hooks. So this is one little thing that you will need to remember when you use this inside your Grails application. So you need a before and after hook, and in that before and after hook, you've got to basically instantiate a binding updater, which is part of the Jeb API, passing in the binding of the script that you're going to be running in, so that would be your step definition, and instantiating a new browser and passing that in and setting that as binding updater. Then you initialize that, and then later, at the end of the test run, you need to remove it again. So you can 
you can put any long running fixtures inside those before and after um, steps. And like I said, they run before and after each scenario. A controller that we're going to use to serve this endpoint. Very, very simple. We instantiated and, and saved the quote inside the, um, the step definition. So now here we're literally doing a quote at find by name using GORM, passing in the name, and that will return a quote to the front end. And that's a GSP that we're going to use to just render the page. Okay, so let's take a, a very quick look at that. Um, here's the application. Right, so everything's there as described. There's our controller. Um, we've got all the, the configuration. There's our Cucumber config, exactly as I just explained. So let's run that up and actually see what it does. So it runs within your IDE. You don't have to thankfully step into a terminal and lose your IntelliJ session again. <laughs> Okay, that's now starting up the app. Right, there's our Chrome. There's our quote for Invader Zim. I've put a sleep in there of about five seconds so that you could just see what it was actually doing. Otherwise, it's over in a flash. There's Invader Go's quote, and all tests are green. Right, so just a, a quick word about um, that Chrome instance that you saw coming up, um, Jeb is really great at caching those, those um, Chrome instances, so it won't start up a new browser every single time. It'll just keep that one browser open and keep reusing it. So on the initial run, like you saw now, it takes a while for it to start up, but once your tests start running, they go really fast because it just keeps using that same browser. Right, so just in conclusion, um, BDD helps us to collaborate. That's the bottom line. It adds a new dimension to software development, the human part that we've been missing all along. It helps us build software that really hits the mark, software that was actually required in the first place, not what we thought was a good idea, but what everybody involved in the development wanted. Cucumber, JVM, and Gradle work very nicely together. In fact, all of Groovy works really nicely with Cucumber. And the Grails Cucumber plugin really does rock. It's a, it's a very nice addition to the Grails ecosystem. And BDD is a lot of fun, I think. Thank you very much. Right, any questions? None? Okay, thank you.